the past three lectures, we basically looked at how we can actually go and distribute models over several machines. And that in combination also with Moose Talk should have given you a bit of an idea of how you can take a model, break it down into individual components, and then distribute those components over a you know, large set of computers, and then therefore solve it in a distributed fashion. Okay. So that's a really useful thing. Um, however, what it doesn't do is it actually doesn't tell you necessarily how you can deal with very, very large models and actually make them fit into memory. Right? So today, we're going to go and look at two different versions of how to accomplish this task. And we may or may not actually be able to finish the last bit, namely uh, the cuckoo hashes, simply because, well, I guess Tico actually has a couple of announcements to make. And so overall, we might run out of time a little bit. Um, so this is something that actually came out of a talk that Mutu Mutu Krishnan gave in Pune at a workshop maybe about five, six years ago. And actually, Mutu is the next speaker up. Uh, assuming that his flight and everything works out fine. So here's what is actually a very, still a very common approach to dealing with text. I mean, yes, you can have a deep network, a deep convolutional network, and you can do a lot of other, a lot more sophisticated things. But this is still a model that goes, that's going very strong. And I just want to use it as a motivation, namely vector space models for documents. In other words, I just count how many times a particular token occurs, and I turn this into a vector, and then I can do efficient inference. Okay. So that gives me you know, nice linear functions, for instance. So f of x is w dot x plus maybe some constant. And these models are in extremely widespread use. So for instance, for spam filtering, internet advertising, ranking retrieval, um, you would be surprised how widespread the use of those models is. Now, the catch is that those models will work really well as long as we don't have too much data. Oh, sorry, too many parameters. Because at least you know, if I store things inefficiently as a double, I need about 8 bytes per floating point number. So I'll end up with about 8 gigabytes of memory for a billion floating point numbers. If I have a sparse data structure where I basically have to store at least the hash of the word ID, I might end up paying something like 12 bytes. If I manage to compress the floating point a little bit, OK, maybe we are, we're back to 8 bytes. So in other words, 8 to 16 gigabytes is not an unreasonable amount of memory to spend on a billion parameters. Now, uh, what if I have more? Right? This is not so uncommon. Uh, for instance, if I actually have a large user base with maybe a billion users, and each of those users maybe needs on his own at least a couple of thousand parameters, then you are talking about the trillion parameters. So how can I actually deal with such gigantic models and still do inf efficient inference? Maybe solve an L1 penalized problem, which then gives me back a model that ultimately can fit into a small amount of memory. And so basically, you know, how can I make the model small enough if I can't upgrade the memory of my computers? So let's look at a slight motivation for this. And this is essentially an example of a hierarchical model. It's personalized spam filtering. So let's say somebody sends you an email, and this email goes to a lot of users. Right? So then, well, those users might actually annotate this email in interesting ways. So, I mean, this is the ideal user that you want. Well, you know, she gets the email and she annotates it as spam. And, well, that's great, but not all users do that. I mean, after all, Nigerian spammers also got to live, right? Um, some users just have no idea what that button does. And I guess we've all done enough tech support of that form. Well, spammers have email accounts too. They even have hacked, you know, stolen credit cards and so on. So there's a fair amount of mislabeling there. And may I ask, when was the last time you labeled an email as spam? One week ago? 
One month ago? This year? Okay, so that's the problem, right? In many cases, it turns out, fortunately, you can actually infer from the user's behavior, you know, whether an email is possibly spam or not. So, as a piece of advice in your own interest, if you want to have high quality spam filtering, do label. And I'll show you a little bit of a picture of how labeling actually helps you directly. Um, so here's an easy way how you could solve the problem, right? Each of, those e each of those users gets his own classifier and we decide to spam filter on their own classifier. Okay. Uh, what could possibly go wrong if I did this? Any suggestions? Why is this a terrible idea? Yep. Most of the users will get bad classifiers. Why would they get best, bad classifiers? Uh, well, because only one of them did the right thing. Well, that's true. A much more serious problem is that most users don't label a lot of emails. So the training set for each user would be minuscule. I mean, it would be maybe 10, 20 emails. And well, each user getting his own classifier maybe isn't too bad. So for instance, I'm terrible with administrative emails. And I might occasionally actually skip and ignore them or maybe even label them as spam. On the other hand, that's exactly why I have a really great admin who makes sure that I don't forget all the administrative emails that I really need to take care of. And some people might feel inadequate and actually want, might want to reply to some body part enhancement or otherwise stimulating things, right? So, in other words, everybody's idea of what spam is is slightly different. So, in other words, the spam classifier that works for me might be a terrible thing for you. On top of that, well, if I have a spammer, right? Wouldn't it be nice if I could make the spammer believe that his own spam gets through, but nowhere else, right? So, but the big challenge is really that each user gets his own subset of emails, and there isn't a lot, and especially, well, she's not going to get anything. So, that doesn't work. So, the solution to that is to try to have a bit of the best of both worlds, by having a what's called hierarchical model. In this hierarchical model, what you do is you basically have a global classifier, which essentially tries to deal with the aggregate consensus of you know, what is considered spam by most humans. And then also model the slight deviation that each individual has relative to the global classifier. Who has heard about the kill file before? Or basically how to deal with trolls in the old days on the internet? Okay, I guess everybody knows what a troll is, right? Okay, so if a troll signs up in a forum, well, he will go and start, you know, writing stupid stuff and people get upset and they start, you know, a flame war and then at some point the moderator of the forum decides, well, okay, it's time to kick this guy out. So he closes down his account, and guess what happens? The troll comes back under a new idea, and he keeps on doing this. Okay. So in other words, uh, constraining things by restricting the accounts is only of limited use for a really persistent troll. But what's much more effective is if the troll doesn't get any replies, then he'll just be very frustrated and go away and you know, go somewhere else. And so what people at some point realized is that you can actually do this. Namely in such a way that only the troll gets to see his own posts and nobody else sees them. And so this way, well, the troll realizes that nobody likes his very insightful and deep comments and he goes away and trolls somewhere else. Okay. Effectively, what we're building with this is a machine learned version of such a kill file. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to build a system where the spammer sees his own spam arriving on his own accounts and nowhere else. And we'll do this by having personalization for each user separately and a global consensus 
So this way, you know, the spammer still sees that, you know, all sorts of other spam gets rejected. So for instance, you know, a diploma mill will still see the 419 scam being rejected, but well, diploma's not. Okay. So here's how you can do this. And let me quickly show you the pictures. Apologies for the animations not being so pretty, but Keynote between versions decided to destroy all my slides, so these are PDF backups. Um, so what you basically do is you have a consensus classifier, right? This is basically so Firefox. This is, for instance, our bag of words representation of the document. We have some common parameter. And then for each user, we have his own parameter, wu. And the aggregate score of spamminess in this case, and you can do a lot of other things than just spam filtering, is composed by the sum of the general consensus score and the user-specific spamminess score. And now what you can do with a slight degree of manipulation, and we saw a little bit about feature spaces and so on already, you can basically write this as the features of the document or whatever else the user looks at product with one direct sum plus the identity of the user. So in other words, what I've done is I've pasted all the user vectors, uh, user parameters plus the common parameter into one gigantic vector and all the features also in one gigantic vector. Since this is linear and this is linear and I just go and match up coefficients, this is just fine. This is just a mathematical nicety, right? There's no real difference between those two models. This is just much nicer to write out. However, it turns out that this gives us a clue of how to deal with this model efficiently. Right? Because now what we've done is we've turned the multitask problem into a linear classification problem in a ridiculously much larger space. So how much larger? Well, let's say we have a million different tokens that I could receive. And so that's, you know, 10 to the 6. And let's say I have a billion users, so that's 10 to the 9. So then that means we are operating now in a 10 to the 6 plus 9 dimensional space, right? That's pretty big. Um, now, by the way, this is if we were to look at the kernel that is, is associated with that, we would have to take the inner product between this and, you know, for a different you know, document X prime and a different user U prime, we would basically get this kernel here, right? Because, you know, whenever we have the one here, we just get K of X and X prime, the inner product between 5X and 5X prime. However, when the users also match, I get an additional increment here. <clears throat> so it's basically twice the inner product when the users match and otherwise just simply the inner product. Okay, this is as it turns out, a fairly well understood and old idea. So basically, Pontil and Michelli proposed this about a decade ago, and Hal Dorm wrote this beautiful paper about uh, embarrassingly simple multitask learning with the help of maybe a 10 line Perl script. And basically, what he did is he explicitly constructed this representation, which is kind of cool if the number of tasks is like 10, right? But we have, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of tasks, namely each user is his own task. So while you can still solve this efficiently, you know, on tiny probes with, you know, a dozen tasks, for many numbers of tasks, you need to use something slightly different because, well, even in a benign case, well, we are talking about, you know, 40 to maybe 100 terabytes of possible parameter space. So you, you cannot possibly hope to solve this at least not in the next few decades because, well, you know, even if you look at Moore's law, you might have to wait many, many years before machines will have that much memory. Right. Okay. So, how do we solve this? So, one thing that I guess you will actually see in Mutu's lecture is the count min sketch, but in the context of what we're doing here, let's just see, okay, actually let me Okay, so keep this picture in mind when you see Mutu's lecture, but let me just give you a brief idea of what we're doing. 
we're basically taking a vector and we're mapping it into another vector that is lower dimensional, namely sufficiently low dimensional that everything works. And for each coordinate that we have, we just pick a random hashed coordinate there and we multiply it with some value. Let me give you an example of how this really happens in practice. So let's say you get some email, possibly spam, right? And a simple thing that you could do, and but don't worry, we won't need a dictionary later on, is, well, we take each word, we perform a lookup in a dictionary which maps the word like mention, or the word mention composed with a task Barney, so mention underscore Barney, into a word ID. So this is something that's very commonly done to tokenize. And so we get this, you know, very large vector. I mean, that's basically this 40 terabytes dimensional space. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a hash function. So this hash function takes this token ID and then maps it into a lower dimensional space. But actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to, well, here yeah, this slide is old. Um, I'm going to actually multiply this with a sign of plus one or minus one. Turns out we're not the first ones to have come up with this. This is something that Chen, Farrah, Colton, and a few others actually thought about in the context of the count sketch. And yeah, Moses Charikar. So he actually was a co-winner of the Kanilakis Prize. So now here's what you actually would do. If you think about it, you really don't need this dictionary, right? Because this dictionary, all you do is you just have to do a lookup. Then you get, you turn the word into a number, and then you turn the number into another number by using the hash function. Instead of that, you just feed the string, the identifier directly into the hash function, and you get something that sits there. And on top of that, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to multiply the contribution by one or minus one. So I'm going to refer this as a Rademacher hash, just, you know, one bit hash. And by the way, one bit hashes are very easily obtained from generic hash functions. Just pick any bit that you want, let's say bit number 42, and then check whether it's one or minus one. Do not take the, the value of the hash function, divide it by its maximum value, and then check whether it's greater or less than one half. I know this sounds like a joke, but I actually ha just recently had to go through some code where somebody had done this. Okay. So, now, once we have this feature vector, all I do is I'll take a linear classifier on this compressed vector, and I happily go my way. Okay. Sounds like magic, right? I mean, this sounds like a really crazy incantation that goes and takes a very high dimensional vector, compresses it down to something smaller, and then, you know, with suitable plus minus one multiplications, just ignore the rest. Okay. Who knows what the birthday paradox is? Okay, good. So basically what it means as a corollary for this room here is that I can with very high probability make a bet that there will be at least two people who have the same birthday. Uh, okay, now uh, joking aside, what it really means is that if I have, for instance, a hash function or just any other random mapping, which maps into numbers between one and n, that if I have more than order square root n, many such insertions, the probability that I will actually have a collision is going to be very high. And the threshold is going to be at order square root number of L bins. So remember, we had, you know, this, you know, possibly 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 dimensional space. And we now map it into something that fits into memory. So 10 to the 9 is pretty much going to be our limit. You can see that actually things can possibly go quite badly wrong. So chances of collision are fairly high. It turns out that even though those chances are fairly high, they are usually not disastrous. The reason why they're not so harmful is because I have, as one, as, as one can show, and I'll get to that in a moment, you can show that basically the orthogonality of vectors that basically before were orthogonal is preserved with very, very high probability. And basically, I can 
essentially turn very high dimensional linear algebra with very high probability in linear algebra that in this hashed space is still highly accurate. So there's a lot more theory behind this, and there's basically, um, yeah, basically a lot of sketching literature, a lot of random projections literature that you can use to give much deeper analysis. But I'm just going to convey the intuition of what's happened. As I've already mentioned, you don't need a dictionary, which is actually a big deal, because in most practical cases, the dictionary will take more memory than the actual parameter vector. So this is good news, because now you have, I mean, I challenge you to actually implement a dictionary for this that will use less than 12 bytes per word. I don't think you can do it easily. So. But the point is, if I don't need a dictionary, I don't even have to worry about the memory footprint. It also means that if a new word comes along at any given time, I can still deal with it efficiently. I have a predefined amount of memory. It's a finite memory guarantee. So this is actually really useful. On top of that, in contrast to locality-sensitive hashing, so this is basically some of those other techniques, which basically take a vector and you know, project it with a dense matrix onto a lower dimensional space, I don't get a dense vector out of it. If the vector was sparse before, it'll stay sparse. So let's have a look at it in a little bit more detail. So what I, what, what, what's really happening is I take this original vector. That's you know the email that user Barney receives. It's like very, very sparse. And it gets multiplied with a maximally sparse matrix. This matrix has exactly one non-zero entry per column, but it may have more than one non-zero entry per row. Well, actually, it has to, since the number of rows is less than the number of columns. And the entries are going to be plus or minus one. And they're essentially random. The reason why I'm using hash function rather than a random number generator is that with a hash function, I don't need to store the result of the hash, because each time I feed in the same argument, I get the same thing back. So hint, if you have an algorithm that requires a lot of random numbers that you need to look up over and over and over again, don't actually do this, but instead use hash functions instead. So this way, you will never need to actually have that data structure for the lookup. And you, what you're basically trading off is memory and data structure versus computation. Because of course, you need to invoke the hash functions again. But then, quite often, processes are much faster than memory lookups, so you are actually going to win, especially on very high multi-core systems. Because they share the memory bandwidth, but the CPUs can do all of the other things locally. Now, let's check a few things. So let's check what happens if I take an inner product, I hash up each of those vectors, and OK, so here's what happens. I basically have you know, sum over all bins which have a collision. So wi sigma of i, so that, that stays there. And basically, hash of i equals j. That's basically the j bin here. Likewise, for the second vector, I also need to check whether that bin is the same. And now I have to sum over all the bins. Okay. So, OK, so this is basically what happens if I take an original vector, I hash it down, take the inner product there. Now, if I use this Rademacher hash, so basically where you know, the probability of i being 1 or minus 1, likewise i prime being 1 or minus 1, that probability is just you know, delta i i prime. So in other words, only if i and i prime are the same, then you know, those values will always be the same. Otherwise, they will be uncorrelated. In this case, taking the expectation over this quantity here immediately shows me that the inner product is preserved in expectation. So what I've basically done is I've turned my inner product into a random variable where the expectation of that random variable is the original inner product. And by concentration of measure, and after all, you know, we are summing over a, maybe a billion dimensions, this is not too bad. Okay. So a couple of nice things are so if I have orthogonality before, then in the smaller dimensional space, things are still approximately orthogonal. And you can 
immediately check that basically just by using, you know, hefting. It's very, very straightforward because what you basically have is you have a random variable where each of the entries is a bounded value, a bounded range. You know the expectation of that random variable, namely it's going to be exactly what you wanted before, and then you just apply standard tail bounds. So this is very, very straightforward. What it means is that whenever I had, you know, initially a direct sum in Hilbert space, then by using hashing, I actually get the sum in this hashed space. This is a very useful property. So for many tensorial and other representations, when I would have tensor products before, I can actually turn them into much more useful representations otherwise. The good thing is that the hash in the product is unbiased, the variance is small, and there's a lot more, much more sophisticated detailed analysis by Kumar Shalosh and Dasgupta from 2010, and then a follow-up paper by Clarkson and Woodruff, and interestingly, okay, they cite us, Clarkson and Woodruff cites them, but they give tighter bounds yet again for the hash kernel. So this is essentially what you can do. Um, all of this would be in vain if it didn't actually work, but it does work. So this is a small data set. This is 20 million emails, about 400,000 users. And this was still at Yahoo. And obviously, I cannot tell you what the actual baselines are for spam filtering. So we just normalized that to one. And so here's what we did. We first took the unpersonalized spam filter, and we hashed it up into anything between 2 to the 18 and 2 to the 26 dimensions. Okay. So 2 to the 20, that's a million. Right? So what you can see is that you can't really see much. Namely, the performance is pretty much the same throughout. And basically, you know, starting from 4 million dimensions, you don't really see anything at all. Uh, which is actually kind of nice because the vocabulary is clearly larger than a thousand. So the birthday paradox didn't hurt us too much. Um, so if you haven't seen anything about birthday paradoxes and similar things yet, there's a fantastic book by Mitzenmacher and Upfall. I think it's called Probability in Computing. So it's a fabulous book. Get that, read it. It's nice reading and it'll help you a lot. And it's extremely well written. OK, now, OK, so what we saw is that, well, you can't really see anything there, right? So this blue curve pretty much at, you know, 4 million dimensions matches everything else. Now, for this red curve, we couldn't actually get the correct baseline. So remember, this black line is the correct baseline where we really look at all the dimensions, and you can do that in the unpersonalized case. But for the personalized case, the number of dimensions would be too large. So all we can do is we can just look at how it performs. And what you can see is that as you add the number of dimensions, well, things tend to get a little bit better still. But you know, going up here by a factor of four in terms of the dimensionality doesn't really help you very much. But what you can overall see is you get about one third reduction error. By the way, really bad idea, and I've seen people try it more than once. So do not waste your time on that. Playing with the number of bits is a bad way of regularizing your model. It's an extremely bad way of regularizing your model. Don't try. Also, playing with the hash functions is an extremely bad way of improving things. Don't do it. Unfortunately, I've seen people waste weeks on this futile task. So just don't. It's really a waste of your time much better to actually start thinking about more interesting representations of the function class. Okay. So the interesting thing, however, is that, well, you know, there are all those users that are really lazy, right? And for them, well, we don't really have many emails labeled. So what you could actually or would want to do is you might want to see whether even for those users that don't really label very much, and that's the majority of the users, I mean, remember that, you know, log, uh, whether they still benefit. And so it turns out that they actually do. So what you can see here is a graph of the same error rates as what I showed you before, 
but now stratified by the number of annotations that each user gives you. And so you might actually ask, you know, how do I know for a user that didn't label anything, you know, whether it's correct? Well, you can just take a user who labeled at least one email and remove that label, or you can use other indirect signals to infer whether something is correct or not. Okay, so that basically shows you that you can actually very efficiently compress you know, function space representations and make things fit. Okay, let me show you another application. And given that Mutu isn't here yet, I think it's perfectly okay if Zico makes the announcement about competitions and everything at 11 o'clock. So I'll be basically using up the time until 11 and we'll just wait until Mutu shows up. Okay, so here's the issue. So spammers at some point realized that, you know, let's say Viagra, if they put that into an email, the spam filter will figure it out and then, you know, reject the email. Okay, so what they did is they used all sorts of creative and interesting ways of misspelling that word without really, well, trying to circumvent the spam filter. It's kind of a tug of war because if you respell it very different, then, well, the intended recipient will not be able to read it anymore. And the intended recipient is usually, are usually people who are maybe not people with a PhD, right? So uh, you can't really use a very large hamming distance. On the other hand, well, if you stay very close, then it's easy for a spam filter to, well, detect it. But the problem is you now need to actually generate all those wildcards. And here's the general idea. You basically want to use the spelling and all the misspellings, and you actually want to cover this much, much larger space of possible string variations. And by the way, this is not just used for spam filtering, but you can use the same thing also for bioinformatics. So, for instance, I mean, if I wanted to not sell Viagra, but, you know, misspell Carnegie in all sorts of interesting ways, these would be some of them. But what I can basically do is I can replace individual characters by wildcards, and I can do that for any one position. And now I can basically check whether I have a match between one string with a wildcard in, let's say, position three, and another string also with a wildcard in position three. So this way, I get around the issue of having a combinatorial explosion in terms of the alphabet size. So for instance, if you think about it, okay, so here's at position five, I've Basically, this would match not just CARN 3GIE, but it would, pro it would match any other character that I could put in here. So this, to some extent, reduces the complexity in terms of having to count how many different mismatches I have from exponential in the dictionary size to something that's now only you know, polynomial in the number of wildcards. Rather much more beneficial. And, but I still now need to actually, you know, count all those fragments. And instead of counting them, well, I'm actually going to use the hash kernel. So let's take a DNA sequence. Um, my guess is everybody knows the movie that goes with it. If not, you should watch it. But let's just, it's also, of course, a sequence of base pairs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into all sorts of substrings. This is actually something that people do. There's something called the spectrum kernel where people have actually analyzed this. And so this would be basically, you know, three mirrors, four mirrors, five mirrors, and so on. Right? So I can do that. And then I can go and also look at all the approximate matches here, maybe for, you know, the six mirrors. And this, again, leads to a combinatorial explosion. Again, I can actually go and insert that into, well, the hash. So if you look at it, doing things brute force, here would require 45 terms, but if I just use hashing, then this is actually quite trivially done. So there are a whole bunch of papers which look at amazingly sophisticated data structures for storing all those approximate matches and so on, but if you use hashing, you can just throw out the data structure and be happy with it. 
So that's why I'm advocating it. I'm going to skip over the matrix compression. I'm just going to, okay, great, Mutu is here. I'm just quickly just going to show you what happens when you want to, okay, just a moment, when you don't actually want to have mismatches and collisions. And so this is actually some very, very new work. It's not entirely published yet. Um, but basically, this works around the issue of, well, what if I don't actually like collisions? And it comes with a big caveat, namely, if, what if I don't like collisions, but actually my final model, if I apply sparsity, fits into memory. So I'll take, it'll take me about five minutes to explain this. And this came out of an idea, uh, basically, at some point somebody asked me, uh, when I was talking about the hash kernel, well, suppose I actually ha want to have L1 sparsity and the final model is small enough. Can you solve the problem exactly then? And we first tried actually using hash kernels directly and it did not work very well because basically there were too many uh, uncertainties in parameter recovery on real data. But there's an efficient way of avoiding this. So I need to show you another data structure that's actually really nice. And it's actually also on GitHub. So Dave Anderson has a very nice implementation of this. So who has heard about the cuckoo hash before? Wow, some, some people actually have heard about it. So that's great. So um, for everybody else, uh, the idea was proposed by Park and Rodler in 2001. And they almost got everything right except for one minor detail, and I'll get to that. And basically, here's what happens. If I have arbitrary keys, and I want to store them in such a way that lookup for key values is constant time, then one way of achieving this is, well, I just you know create an array. And what I now do is I compute the hash of the key, let's say for instance, you know, mention underscore Barney, and we go somewhere, let's say at position A. And if that location is empty, everything's good and I just write, you know, the value for mention underscore Barney in there. If that, if that location is already taken, let's say for instance, well, let's say for instance here, then what happens is I compute a second hash and try another location. Okay, good. Well, nothing particularly interesting happens if that location is free. Then I just insert it in that second location. Everything's good. Now, what if both locations are taken? What happens then is I actually go and evict the thing that's in the second location. So it goes here. So B has to go. It gets evicted, kicked out of the nest, hence the name cuckoo hash, and it finds its own new location. Now, if that location was taken as well, that element would get kicked out, and, it, and you would just keep on doing this until at some point everybody finds its space. So what you can clearly see is an insertion may trigger off a very, very lengthy chain. But it turns out that if the array is not too full, and there's some very nice theoretical analysis for this, you can get away with short insertion chains. So what you're exploiting here is the fact that while insertion may be more than constant time, the lookup afterwards of something that's already in that list is constant time because there can only be two possible locations where a particular key could be found, either the first or the second location. The problem with this approach, however, is that you need to actually store the key in that location and unless you know that it's there, well, you won't be able to actually find out whether what's, uh, you know, what you have. And the problem with this is twofold. First of all, that key can actually be very long. And if it's very long, then, well, I end up having to use a variable length data structure and all sorts of other things. I need this secondary list that I index into or do, do something else that's very expensive. And the key trick that Dave Anderson came up with is to basically just store a small signature in that location 
and then use XOR to decide what hash location 1 or hash location 2 are. So here's really what happens. So I basically store a small signature of the key in that location. And then I compute the hash of the signature in XOR the first hash with this, ha with this other hash. So this gives me hash 2. But of course, since I have XOR, all I have to do is just XOR again, I get the original hash back. So I can flip-flop between those two locations without really ever having to look up the original X again. Of course, there's a catch. And the catch to it is that, well, I've now reduced a little bit the range of different locations that I could have. So H1 and H2 are not quite as independent of each other anymore as they should be. And right now, this is an open theoretical question to prove that under which conditions this is still good enough to really have a very short terminating chain in practice. Well, I have a short terminating chain. However, in practice, it works beautifully. So we skipped that little ugliness and actually use this. By the way, to deal with poor fill rate, you actually have several slots per location here, but I'm not going to discuss that in more detail. The nice thing is that as soon as you've sort of kind of filled your cuckoo hash, basically think of it as a sparse vector, um, additional requests at a particular location are now constant time. So you can do all sorts of interesting sparse linear algebra much more efficiently than with any other sparse vector structure, data structure. And then one or two other things, you basically use clever things like prefetching because you don't quite know at which of the two locations it is. So you basically queue up the request and then check whether the first one's there or the other one. So this way, your linear algebra library does not stall while you're actually pulling things from memory. And the nice thing is that if I have a distributed algorithm, and this is, was one of the motivations, I can have my own sparse data structure on each machine separately. And when I merge it, it's still fine to actually reconcile them because I have exactly those signatures. And again, I need to be careful about the birthday paradox and a few other details. But basically, this means that I can very efficiently have local sparse data structures that are easily synchronizable in, you know, basically time, as may, in linear time of the number of elements in the data structure. And it also works amazingly well in practice. So what you basically see here, these are the most boring pictures that you would be seeing. Namely, we compared, you know, LibLinear, which basically does expensive preprocessing to what we do with cuckoo hashing. And the accuracies are the same. And furthermore, the actual runtimes are the same, except that we don't need any preprocessing. That doesn't sound like a big deal here, but if you actually have many machines and you would actually have to synchronize the preprocessing, well, that would be a big issue. We probably didn't argue the case well enough because Katie didn't, didn't like it, but I think it's still quite useful. So let me conclude with this. Um, it's much more efficient than, for instance, the unordered STL map. So it's about twice as memory efficient as the data structure. And this is kind of funny because, well, this is basically solving the problem exactly, but up here is actually a ridiculously high key space, except that you know you can tokenize and do a few other crazy things. But basically, what you can see is the cuckoo hash, which is solving the, you know, in this case, gene classification problem exactly, outperforms the hash kernels, and it gives you exactly the data, the data structures that you want, which is actually useful if you're a biologist because you actually care about motives and so on. And I think this is my last slide now, and I just want to leave you with this. So if you're interested in clever data structures, there's a lot more that can be done rather than just using, well, for instance, just your sparse linear algebra library. Overall, I believe there's a lot of really interesting things that are currently happening at the intersection between, well, data structures, systems research, machine learning, and also statistical models. And I think it's only going to get more exciting in the future. And this is my last lecture, so I want to thank you for your attention. And I'll hand over to Tico for a whole bunch of good news about
computer resources and competitions and so on. Okay, thank you.